So good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Hunter, and the first thing I want to do is uh, introduce the very fine lawyers in the Office of the Attorney General who represent you on a daily basis. And with that, everybody in the Attorney General's office, please stand. These are your attorneys. I'd also like to uh, introduce my lawyer, my long-suffering wife, Cheryl Hunter. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone who has joined us for this very special event. We have a great nationally recognized author, journalist, and speaker, Sam Quinones, who I will formally introduce in just a minute. Uh, so. <clears throat> The Attorney General's office, like many instrumentalities of state government, is subject to appropriations. So there are a couple of state representatives here, Mark LePac and State Representative Todd Russ, both of whom are friends of mine. Have I missed anybody? <laughs> Appreciate you all coming very much. So the Opioid Study Commission concluded its work uh, today. We issued a report, which we're very hopeful will be acted on uh, with uh, dispatch and alacrity by the legislature. And I would uh, like to just take a minute and uh, recognize the members of the Opioid Study Commission who are here today. So if you would stand, uh, you remember the Opioid Study Commission. I'm not going <laughs> to go into a lot of detail here. John Scully with the uh, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Uh, Chelsea Church from the uh, Pharmacy Board, Bob Howard, Oklahoma City businessman, uh, Dr. Collier, um, Terry White, Commissioner of Mental Health, who am I missing? So tonight would not have been possible would it not, uh, were it not for uh, our sponsor tonight, and so I want to make sure and recognize uh, Bob Howard. Where did Bob go? Okay. Bob and Vicki Howard. Vicki, stand up. Thank you very much. Both of you. Thank you. So we also have, there are other lawyers here uh, tonight. Um, 
You can never have too many lawyers. You know what the good book says? Proverbs eleven fourteen. In an abundance of counselors, there is safety. <laughs> so Mike Burridge and Reggie Witten, are you still here tonight? So there they are. So, and the lawyers with Nix Patterson, our other law firm. So these very fine lawyers are representing the state of Oklahoma in our litigation against opioid manufacturers. And just so everybody knows, we believe that the damages to U.S. taxpayers are in the billions of dollars. We're in court down in Cleveland County in Norman. We have a trial date for May of 2019, and we're going to get your money back. Right? Thank you. So there are tons of other people I could introduce. Um, and I don't know where to start and where to finish here. But I did want to recognize Gail and Craig Box. They're here this evening. And I can't think of anybody in the state who's done more to bring attention to this nightmarish epidemic than the two of you. Thank you for being here very much. So I witnessed uh, an, an introduction uh, several years back. A good friend of mine uh, got to introduce Charlton Heston. And after he got done, Heston, <clears throat> Heston got up and he said, you know, I've been introduced by captains and kings, by governors and presidents, by, by popes and saints. But I have to say that was the longest introduction that I <laughs> ever received. So that's not going to happen tonight. Uh, you didn't come here to you didn't come here come here to hear me, um, and you've indulged me, and so I'm I'm going to very briefly um, give you some background on uh, our speaker tonight, Sam Quinones, who is the author of the book Dreamland. So there have been a number of books um, over the years that have changed the thinking of our body politic. You know, one maybe is uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Tubman and others may be Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Uh, Dreamland is the one book that has begun to bring the body politics focus on just how nightmarish, just how horrific the opioid epidemic is in this country. And I can't thank Sam enough for the time and effort he put into this, uh, this wonderful book. So, I wanted to just share with you uh, a couple of passages that I, I really think are powerful and important to me. In his introduction, he, he writes, this epidemic involved more users and far more death than the crack plague of the 1990s or the heroin plague of the 70s, but it was happening quietly. Kids were dying in the Rust Belt of Ohio and the Bible Belt of Tennessee. Some of the worst of it was in Charlotte's best country club enclaves. It was in Mission Viejo and Simi Valley in the suburban South California, Southern California, and in Indianapolis, Salt Lake and Albuquerque, in Oregon and Minnesota and Oklahoma and Alabama. For each of the thousands who died every year, many hundreds more were addicted. So at this time, it is my pleasure, distinct pleasure, to introduce award-winning journalist and writer, uh, Sam Quinone. Sam. All right then. How are you guys doing? Everybody good? Great. It's great to be back in Oklahoma. I, uh, I was first here in 2003 when I was uh, working on a story, you know that in Mexico, I lived in Mexico for a long time, right? You know that in Mexico they have colonies, groups, of uh, communities of, of, of German um, Mennonites. Well, so they don't speak anything but German and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, when I was down there, uh, what, well, I came, met one of these people, and they told me about how the German Mennonites were mightily involved in uh, drug trafficking with the Juarez uh, drug cartel, and that just blew my mind. And then they said, and you know that the biggest, this one person told me, the biggest drug bust ever, uh, at that point anyway, uh, Mennonite dope was in Oklahoma. 
and I called a uh, wonderful, turned out to be a wonderful um, uh, uh, agent at your uh, Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics, Jesse Diaz, and he didn't know what to make of me at first, and he was very suspicious, but then we got to know each other and uh, explained to me the, uh, the, this amazing case that y'all had in 1999, long ago. And so I spent a whole ton of time in, 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 in Oklahoma City writing about drug trafficking Mennonites, of all things. And so Oklahoma has always been like this state where I kind of like, oh yeah, the Mennonites. I went down to the Mennonite area and they almost, I mean, that was about as close as I've ever come as a reporter uh, to being murdered. Uh, you can, it's a bizarre idea that you know, would be follow, you've been followed with pe by people meant to do harm. It never happened to me except for one time, and that was when German Mennonites were, the other people were in the horse and buggy 20 years before. Now, <laughs> now they're in a, now they're in like big, big, huge Ford, Ford pickups, and, and I was, anyway, it's an, it was amazing. So, uh, Jesse retired a while back, and I think he lost a really good agent when he did. Uh, the state, uh, uh, I thought he had, a, you had a great public servant in, in, in him. And um, anyway, that was um, my introduction, believe it or not, to, to the state of, state of Oklahoma. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, Attorney General. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Mr. Howard, wherever he went, there he is back there. Thank you very much for your support on this. I'd like to also thank uh, Lori uh, Carter for being such a professional and, and a sweet person to, to deal with over the several months, it seems like we've been planning, planning this. So, um, uh, you know, when I uh, started this book, uh, I was telling some folks earlier, I uh, told my wife, when I was in the middle of the book, I told my wife, you know, um, I'm going to write this book and uh, it's going to come out and we are uh, going to be on to the next book in about three months because, you know, I've been all over this country and nobody cares about this topic or nobody, rather better put, nobody wants to talk publicly about this topic except for some cops, some public health folks, CDC, yeah, but apart from that there just isn't, you know, I could see it's a problem all across the country and everybody doing their best to keep it quiet. The obituaries are not really telling the truth. Um, and if the media doesn't really care too much, if the media doesn't care, uh, it's hard to get much interest. And then, of course, the politicians aren't really caring. So, so I told her, you know, this is going to come out, and, and we're going to be on to the next project uh, very, very shortly. And um, it's been three years now, almost three years, in April came out in 2015, uh, that I've been uh, going around the country. Uh, my wife and I have been in a state of utter shock because now it's become the issue that probably should have been what like 10 years ago I suspect something like that and uh, that's tough for the country but it's also healthy because this has been brewing and building for an awful long time and um, and uh, we're anyway my family has been totally changed by it I think we're we're just stunned and amazed and brought to tears frequently by um, the poignancy of sometimes of the stories and the people we 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 meet. We were just in uh, Washington D.C. Um, I bizarrest idea. I testified before the U.S. Senate, the Health Committee of the U.S. Senate. Uh, ma amazing concept that I would do that, but um, they wanted me to do it, so I did. You know. Um, Anyway, it's been an amazing thing, and, and, and I think what's happening is, uh, what you're seeing is that this is going on, what's become clear is that this is going on all across the country, and my, I would say where I speak is kind of a barometer. I've done, spoken in Utah, Honolulu, Vermont, you know, Virginia, Wisconsin, Ohio, Kentucky, you know, Mississippi, etc. So it's, it's all across um, this country, and I think... Um, uh, um, understanding why is uh, is an important um, is an important thing for us all to do. Let's say um, tonight. I just want to give you my conception of how and why and what all went into um, this this uh, starting. I think it begins really uh, with um, in the in the really in the early 1980s, goes back about that far, the roots of it, 
uh, where, uh, during which time, a, a group of, of pain specialists, young docs who had gone into medicine for the right reasons to change, you know, uh, to alleviate pain. And they saw, rightly, correctly, that we were doing an awful job of it. We did not treat pain very, very well. We, we, were, uh, we, we didn't understand it. We didn't have the tools. They believed, these young docs kind of developed a kind of an esprit de corps, kind of a this collective conscience as they, as they grew into their profession, as they wrote journal uh, uh, articles and what have you. And they began to believe that there was, uh, that we did an awful job of, 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 of treating it and that we could do better, that we had the tools. We had the tools to alleviate pain and we didn't use them uh, because doctors were afraid to and those tools were narcotic painkillers. They made the argument that we don't even give them to dying cancer patients. People who have three, six months to live, uh, we don't give it to doctors, don't give them these drugs to those people because they're afraid they'll get addicted, but who cares? You know, who cares if a person in the last three months is addicted to a drug if that person's able to live those last three months in a very humane uh, uh, way, free, free of, uh, of pain? And they were right. They, they won the, these arguments early on. The problem was that they kept pushing. They didn't stop. They were revolutionaries, you know, and revolutionaries have a tendency to just want to destroy everything on their way to, to a better, better world. They, they began to make the argument that there was, uh, that these pills were now known to be virtually non-addictive when used to treat, when used to treat pain. That the, well, less than 1% of all people who were treated with these pills uh, for pain got, got uh, uh, addicted. They kept pushing at this. There was no scientific <coughs> evidence of this, but they're revolutionaries, you know, the ends justify the means. And so it didn't matter. What they really wanted to do was to kind of kick some doors down and, and uh, uh, find an old, a new way uh, to, to a new way of treating, of treating pain. And they believed that these, this, these pills, these, these drugs were, were the key, were the key to that. They were joined in all this by uh, pharmaceutical companies eventually, whom they viewed as allies. We have a jaundiced view of pharmaceutical companies today, but back then, these folks viewed them as allies because they were the ones, those were the companies making the new tools to fight pain, right? So they, they could find, they, they, they saw each other as, as allies in this, and, they, and it's likely that these pain specialists would not have nearly had the, the, the effect that they had were they not joined by the megaphone of the influence and money uh, the pharmaceutical companies who, who saw in them a natural ally as well. And together, they kind of formed a, a juggernaut that moved forward through the 1980s into the 19, 1990s. During these, these years as well, there were changes that also helped this along, it seems, it se it seems to me. We had a, um, a I, I believe it, a lot of it had to do with change in American culture. We believed we won the Cold War. We wanted to kick back. We wanted to kind of uh, the complications of the world to be put aside. We wanted to have it easy, comfortable. We began to believe that we were entitled to a life free uh, of, of pain, that we didn't really, we're, we're not, we're, we were, uh, you know, we're, we were exceptional. Because we won the Cold War, we just kind of wanted something easier. We, at the same time, there was a, a, a in medicine, there developed the a Patient's Bill of Rights, the kind of the a patient's rights movement that held that uh, doctors needed to listen to patients with a good idea. But that got pushed pretty far uh, as well. And soon it was, particularly when it came to pain, doctors needed to always be at paying attention to the patient's pain and that a pay pain was what a patient says it is, where he said it is, when he says it is. The patient's rights movement begins to, to, to develop uh, 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 out of this. At the same time, medical uh, establishment helps us along by deeming uh, yes, so we're an epidemic of pain, and we don't, ha uh, and we need to uh, get doctors to really pay attention to pain. So they deem pain uh, the fifth uh, vital sign. Very p important moment is when uh, JCO, the organization deemed, uh, dedicated to hospital uh, accreditation, and the VA deem that pain should be now considered the fifth vital sign. But pain is not a vital sign. A vital sign is something you cannot live without, you know, you can't, a pulse, that's a vital sign. Pain you can live without, you, will, you can live with. Also pain was, was the only vital sign, all the vital signs you want to maintain them. Pain was the first vital sign in which doctors were, were aggressively pushed to batter it down to zero. 
It was, it was really just a way of pushing docs, putting another point of pressure on doctors to get them to begin to address pain in a very, very uh, uh, aggressive way. The patient's rights movement, meanwhile, develops, and along with that come doctor evaluations. Did the doctor treat your pain well? One question, but doctors get dinged. They have a, a, a effects on their compensation and retention for getting enough of these bad uh, 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 ev evaluations and along come, of course, at the same time, uh, these, these scales that are used to measure pain. The smiley faces, you guys have probably seen those in the hospital, no? The 1 to 10 scales and all of this is just a way of saying, doctor, you must now make this the central part of your, of your practice. And, and uh, this is taught now in medical school. As the 90s progress, more and more medical schools begin to adopt this. Continuing in medical education for experienced docs also begin to, to adopt this. On and on it goes, but it really, I think, coincides in American culture with the feeling that we as Americans are entitled to a life free of pain. The doctors are car mechanics, our bodies are cars, we're going to take them in and doc, you're just going to fix us. And by the way, we as patients, consumers of healthcare, are not going to be really accountable for helping you. You say, well, uh, the reason that you're in pain is connected to the fact that you eat poorly, don't get exercise, you're overweight, on and on and on, you smoke, all this stuff. We're, we, as a culture, as a country, kind of said, no. You know, we just want you to fix us. Give us a, 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 quick, a, a quick fix. <clears throat> Increasingly, doctors began to prescribe prescribe these, these pills. There wasn't, they, they were faced with an epidemic of pain, and they had one, increasingly one tool. Insurance companies began to cut back on the amount of, uh, amount of uh, other pain strategies that they would reimburse, and increasingly there was one tool that doctors had to deal with this now epidemic of pain that they, they said the country was facing and their patients were, were facing above all. And they began to, in the long run, kind of marketing, marketing worked. Uh, they began to prescribe these things massively all across the country. Key year in this was 1996. 1996 is when Purdue Pharma, the company that makes OxyContin, comes out with OxyContin. <laughs> it comes out, though, at this point, not in a vacuum. This was a time when there was an, uh, a sales force arms race going on in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So every company was having more and more salespeople. It used to be salespeople were kind of older guys, most, almost all older guys, very slow moving, very methodical, knew a lot about their product. All of a sudden it was a go-go time. Through the 90s it was, damn it, let's, let's sell this stuff. And every company was hiring more and more and more. They, they, these were a lot of young people, a lot of very handsome and beautiful people. Uh, coming into this, a lot of them came from uh, uh, enterprise rent-a-car or computer gadget sales because you can sell that stuff, you can sell, f sell drugs too to the docs. You butter up the staff first because once you butter up the staff, the doctor is putty, is putty in your hands. They were giving stuff away and key in all this, part of this certainly, was Purdue Pharma. Purdue Pharma's promotion of OxyContin was uh, legendary. Right? They were giving away stuff uh, constantly, m m relentless visits, constant visits, sometimes three, four doctors a day, a, a visits a day to one doc for different, different um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sales reps. They would give away fishing hats, give away calendars, give away trips to Scottsdale for continuing medical education seminar. There was a fantastic um, uh, CD that they gave away, uh, uh, the title of which was uh, Swing in the Right Direction with OxyContin. And on the cover was a couple, elderly couple, because they're trying to mostly to try to convince elderly docs to change their ways. The younger ones are kind of already on board. The, the, the elderly couple walking through a garden, smiling, madly in love, and the, the CD was like Woody Herman and Count Basie and all these, all these um, uh, uh, swing tunes. And in the end, as I say, Marketing work. You can see uh, the graph is, is fascinating. Uh, opioid prescribing in the in the in the country f for years, decades, really is like a, an airplane going down the tarmac. And in 1996, it lifts off and it doesn't stop rising until just a few uh, a few years ago. It just rises like a steady, like an airplane into the sky. P pain management 
becomes radically transformed. When it started, pain management viewed in each individual as a whole, as a as kind of a, uh, deserving of kind of a holistic approach. So there was one person in chronic pain would get a variety of an assortment, a smorgasbord of treatment options. All it's, many of them would be put put to you. So you know the pain management. So marital counseling, right? Mar marriage is pain. Uh, job therapy, physical therapy, diet, yoga, on and on, and also some portion of opioid painkillers. But that was really a kind of a small, a small part of it. That ends. Insurance companies decide we can just pay for the pills and that's it. They begin to cut back on all these other therapies, all these other strategies, and increasingly, as I say, doctors were left with one, one tool to to um, to address this. <clears throat> But most of all, I think, doctors were who we expected to aggressively address pain. We had, we had an unrealistic expectation. The standard was no pain. That's what our goal was. And doctors were the ones who were going to deliver that uh, 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 to, to us. Some were sued for not addressing pain. Dinged if the patient gave them a bad uh, evaluation. And in time, opiate painkillers became prescribed for all manner of things, all kinds of, but it wasn't just the number of things it was prescribed for, because along with the core, along with the idea that these pills were virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain, came the corollary that was even more dangerous in my opinion, very dangerous idea, which was that there was no ceiling on dose. If they're non-addictive, doesn't matter how many of them you prescribe. So people routinely began to go to, to, to in for um, minor surgery, appendix or what have you, removal, and they'd come out with pain that was supposed to last two, three days at the most, they would get a bottle of uh, uh, 30 days worth of pills with refills, so 60, so 90 days eventually uh, 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 of pills. And in the end, it was a revolution. 1990, Total amount of hydrocodone produced in the world, the world supply of hydrocodone in 1990 was, was three tons. <coughs> world supply of hydrocodone in 2010 was 42 tons and 99% of that was used right here uh, in, the United, in the United United States. But you know, the problem is none of this happens in a vacuum. We thought it happened, we thought we were doing this in a vacuum, it didn't, that's not true. Oxycontin was the game changer in all this. Oxycontin was a game changer for how it was pr first promoted, but it was also a game changer in that it was the bridge to heroin. Before Oxycontin, there was, uh, people would mess around with low dose Vicodin and Percocet, but you know, that all has Tylenol, acetaminophen, what have you. And so by the time you develop anywhere close to an addiction, daily habit, that is desperate enough to want you, make you want to search out something cheaper and, 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 uh, and on the street and that uh, heroin, you've done massive damage to your internal organs and really that didn't happen very often. People would mess around with that but it was not a minor addiction they would, they, would, they, would, they would develop. There was no bridge to heroin until Oxycontin. Oxycontin comes along and it takes people's addiction up to very high level because it has a lot of dope in those pills, 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams, for all has 160 milligrams, with no abuse deterrent. So eventually people get either with doctor prescribing or eventually they, they go, to the, go to the street, they get to very high levels of daily, da da daily use. All of that prescribing has created now a new black market in markets all across all across the country, and when they can't get the pills anymore, the doctor cuts them off, they lose their insurance, a variety of things happen. They go to the street, but on the street, the pills are now in the black market are usually, most times, most places, about 50 cents to a dollar a milligram. So you're paying, doing 150 milligrams a day, 200, well that's 150, 200 dollars a day. It's unsustainable. They began to look for a new alternative that was as potent, or more potent, but cheap, much, much cheaper. And it was then that, that this whole story encountered something that nobody had thought of or nobody had noticed, and that was a change in our heroin market. For years, if you, uh, uh, I'm 59, I grew up with those great heroin movies out of New York City, Serpico, French Connection, all that stuff. That's about the, the way the heroin market was for many, for decades in this country. New York was the big entry point, all the dope, most of it comes from 
Turkey, from Burma, from uh, Thailand, etc. It gets here, historically got here very expensive, relative, let's say relatively expensive and, and, and relatively weak because it had to come from 8,000 miles across two continents, across, a, across an ocean. It was cut repeatedly and by the time it got to the Attic's arm, it was like 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, pure, fairly, fair, fairly weak. In the 1980s, all that changed. These were years, you remember, of the Colombian drug cartels who were very, very effective, very efficient, very fearsome. They were very good at their job. And the Mexicans weren't quite there yet, but they were coming. They were on their way. Right? Well, those guys trafficking other things also began to bring uh, more and more heroin, particularly the Colombians on the East Coast. They began, and what happens is essentially a business thing. It's a competition thing. They out, their heroin outcompetes the heroin coming from the far, far east. It gets here cheaper and increasingly more potent. The, the, the price decline is dramatic. From 1981 for a pure gram of heroin goes down, 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 down through, through into about 2005, six when it get, gets about $500 a gram. From $3,500 down to $500 uh, uh, a gram of pure, uh, of, of pure heroin. The problem is nobody noticed. Right? Nobody noticed because the, uh, uh, we had other issues. We had crack. We had other priorities, crack, we had meth, we had a variety of other things, and heroin was viewed as like a drug that no one cared about, rightfully so. Only the DEA noticed this every, every year writing a report saying, yeah, this is now happening. Now, by the early 1990s, all of our heroin came from Latin America and Colombia, but increasingly, of course, today, almost all of it coming from Mexico. But again, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed until, as a country, as a culture, we began creating huge numbers of new addicts to opiate drugs through this massive overprescribing and this pu relentless pushing of opiate painkillers for all manner of pain and in huge, huge quantities. <clears throat> it wasn't until that, then those folks who were up on 150, 250 milligrams a day looked around for a cheap, more potent alternative and they found it. And that heroin, most of, most of it, uh, uh, as I say, coming from Mexico. We would not have the heroin problem, a heroin problem today, in my opinion, were it not for Oxycontin. And I, I think really just the massive pre prescribing of, of pills. We would not have the kind of heroin problem we have today, which is to say very fatal. Huge new numbers of people dying every, uh, every year were it not for very, very cheap Mexican heroin coming in as an alternative and being discovered as such by addicts increasingly all, all across, across, the, across the country. The, Appalachia was where this started, right? It was the canary in our societal coal mine, so to speak. But of course, we're used to ignoring Appalachia, right? That's one of the places that most ignored, I would have to say, uh, in, in this country. The ground zero for all this was basically Columbus to the north, Cincinnati over here, West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee, parts of Virginia. All of that was kind of Rust Belt and Appalachia, and we just basically ignored it. Until, well, I realized this, that, that there had been a change by the time I got on to this story, and I was writing uh, uh, first stories for the Los Angeles Times, and then, then my book. I began to realize that it had spread far, far, far beyond those areas. Those were areas that the pharmaceutical companies had targeted very, very aggressively with their promotion. That's where you saw a lot of, of, of pharmaceutical uh, reps spending a lot of time was in that, that ground zero area. It's one of the reasons why it was ground, ground zero because it got a very, very heavy dose of promotion by the pharmaceutical. pharmaceutical company, but, 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 but you know, this was spread by doctors. It's not spread by drug traffickers. There's more doctors than there are drug traffickers in the country. And soon it was all across the country and it was especially st striking to me that this was now affecting people and families and places that had done best in the economic expansions of the last, say, 20, 30 years in America. They were people in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, banking center, country clubs, mansions, two new sports teams, Salt Lake City, Indianapolis, the suburbs of those, of those towns. It was the people who had done best. And it was their family, their loved ones, their kids who were getting addicted on drugs, use of all things, to numb pain. Like you look at this story, you go, what pain? 
Look at their life. They got no, they, everything's fine. What's the matter? And it was there at that point that I began to realize that this was a story. This, I thought I was writing. I thought I, I was coming at it as a crime report. I was writing a story about drug traffickers, which I loved writing about, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I began to realize, no, this is a story really about, some, a, 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 about that, but it's also about stuff that's far deeper. It's about who we had become as a country, what we had become, who we had become as Americans. At the root of it, I came to believe as I did my research, <clears throat> was the, the fact that we had spent, it seemed to me, 35 years destroying community in America. We had exalted the private sector, came to believe the free market was some infallible God. We began to admire wealthy business people. Regardless, you know, of how they made their money, did anything of value for, for the, the community. We laughed at government, ridiculed it as, as inefficient, as bumbling, wasteful, and incompetent. Years ago, we had a president who said, government is the problem, as if, you know, I understand what he was trying to say, but that's also to kind of deny the great American experiment, which is to say, the government comes from us. He was saying, no, it's a kind of a foreign invading beast, you know. <coughs> think tanks posited the idea back then, I think, that the government, in fact, posed the greatest threat to personal freedom. Yet, you know, as I was doing the story, I was realizing this is a drug nightmare unleashed entirely by the private sector form of pharmaceutical companies, unleashing what I believe to be the biggest threat to personal freedom today, which is opiate addiction in, 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 in America. As I was doing the story, meanwhile, I realized the only folks who were fighting this, the people who were on the front lines, were coroners, cops, public health workers, uh, jailers, prosecutors, ER docs, county council, county drug counselors, all of whom were drawing a government salary. In this story, all pro profits were private, all costs were public, borne by the public, borne by those same jails, uh, those, those, those county hospitals, police and public health departments. The Sackler family, probably read recently, um, now deemed one of the wealthiest families in America. The Sacklers own, the, the, uh, own Purdue Pharma. They're valued at a uh, net worth of $14 billion by Forbes magazine due to $35 billion worth of sales of OxyContin since the drug came out in 1996. But you know, it seemed to me as I, as I got into this story that this, it went far beyond that as well. <coughs> For I think this was also a time in America when we began to believe in silver bullets and kind of like ideas that we didn't have to be accountable for our own uh, behavior. Seemed to me that during these years, some of the great founding ideas of America got twisted in our pursuit of comfort and convenience. Self-reliance, wonderful American concept, became isolation. Everybody in their own little silo, in their own little world. Accountability was transformed into tantrums whenever a politician or a cop or a, or a, or a doctor or a health worker didn't fulfill our every demand. And then we told pollsters, gee, we've lost faith in the great American uh, uh, experiment. We adopted, I, I think, unrealistic expectations of how much pain we should be asked to tolerate as Americans, but it wasn't just physical pain. It was now psychological pain, humiliation, the hard work, etc. We pursued comfort and convenience, lack of complications, just wanted a quick fix. In politics, compromise. Compromise became a dirty word, the bending of your will to the will of some others and seeing if you can find a common, common ground. That became a, a dirty word in, in, in American politics, seems to me. We wanted easy answers, above all, seemed to me, to complicated problems, and we believed that old rules don't apply to us. Remember, these were years, you remember these years, right? These were years when, when we believed it was absolutely normal for several baseball players every year to hit more than 60 home runs. It happened twice whole history of the sport, right? We believe that it was a, if, if, if you bundled together massive numbers of badly performing home loans and standard and poor staff that thing, AAA, that that was a beautiful thing to invest your money in. And we began to believe that opiate painkillers are massively prescribed to all manner of people, all manner of situations, all across the country would not, would not result in massive and widespread drug addiction. You know, we wanted to have it all, and the pills kind of embodied that, right? The pills were uh, 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 um, 
uh, uh, you get all the pain relief and none of the risk. No addiction, no it's problem, no problem. It's all like a brand new world because we're, we're Americans. Meanwhile, it seemed to me that our desire to uh, pursue comfort and convenience, avoid pain at all costs, meant that we developed in a sensitivity to offense. Americans walk around looking to be offended, wanting to be able to put on uh, social media, oh, I'm so offended that X, Y, or Z has taken place. Meanwhile, I think, and very important in all this, we became ferocious, ferocious in our attempts to keep our kids from feeling pain. They didn't want to let them outside. Bubble wrap them against any problem, any skinned knee, any problem that they might face competing with their friends, the rough and tumble of, of, of uh, kids at, the, at the, uh, the park. We gave trophies to kids just for, you know, just for showing up, right? There have been people who have been prosecuted in this country for letting their kids go to the park alone. That's a shameful uh, thing to say. And I think it has something to do with this, this story, frankly. We developed in a, a horrible fear uh, of the public sphere. As we exalted the private sector, we, 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 we had this horrible fear of the public sphere, terrified of letting our kids go uh, uh, outside, fearing that, again, that they would skin their knees. <coughs> playdates, we had playdates, I hate that term, playdates instead of just going over the house. You know, a week from Tuesday, they're going to have playdate. You know, my mom uh, grew up in Iowa. We grew, up, we grew up in Southern California. My mom's from Iowa. Every afternoon on our street in Southern California, she would go to the sidewalk at 6 p.m. and ring. She had a farm bell. She had rang that farm bell. And on this street, two block long, everybody on the, on the street knew. When the farm bell started ringing, all her boys, there were four of us, had to come home for dinner. Why'd she ring that bell? Because she didn't have a clue where we were. Right? But one thing she did know was that one place we were not going to be on a sunny Southern California afternoon was inside the house. Now I go back to that same street. It's like encapsulates this whole issue. It's in the, I go back to that same street with about 50 miles from where I now live. And, um, and I, uh, uh, I've yet, like I've been there eight times or something like that in the last few years. I've yet to see one single solitary human being on that street. Nothing. The park around the corner, beautiful park, wonderful city park. It's a wonder the city even maintains it anymore. Nobody uses it. You can go there. When I was growing up, I played basketball there until six, all day long, just just play and play and play. Nobody ever uses that that park uh, uh, at all. As a culture, meanwhile, we acted as if private consumption seems to me accumulation of stuff was the path to happiness. We built into our suburbs a deep, sad, I think, isolation, and we called that prosperity. We embraced technology that's, that put us in touch with people all across the, 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 the globe, yet left us ignorant about the guy uh, uh, across, the, across the street. Above all, it seems to me, as Americans, we pretend, we are deluded into pretending that we are informed by 24-hour cable news. 24-hour cable news is just like heroin. Just as addicts come together, once they get addicted, they all just want to talk with people who, who, uh, who do dope, who know where to buy dope, how to use it, blah, 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 blah. 24-hour cable news has done that to our body politics. So now we don't want to talk with anybody who doesn't think like us, talk like us, Believe like us, unless, of course, we're sniping at them on, on social media somewhere. The result of all this, and, and a whole lot more, I think, is that we wound up, as Americans, dangerously you know, isolated, dangerously separate from each other, whether in poverty or in, in affluence. Kids no longer play in the street. Parks are underused. We feel pain from opposing ideas. Why then do we wonder, you know, that heroin is everywhere? Seems to me our very search for painlessness, for comfort and convenience, led us to it. Heroin is the final expression, I think, of values we have fostered in this country for 35 years, a final expression of, the, of our fetish for the private at expense of the public, of the community. The final stuff for a culture that believes that buying stuff, accumulation of stuff, is the path 
to her happiness. Heroin turns every addict into a narcissistic, self-absorbed, solitary, hyper-consumer. A life that finds opiates turns away from family, turns away from old friends and community, and devotes itself entirely to self-gratification by buying and consuming one product, and that product is the drug that most makes being alone not just okay, but preferable, something to seek out. Isolation, I believe. Isolation is heroin's natural habitat. Heroin seems to me the perfect symptom of how isolated we've become from each other as, as Americans and how much we've killed off or ignored that would bring us together. I believe, I believe more strongly than ever, therefore, that the antidote to heroin is not naloxone, it is community. You want to keep kids off heroin? Make sure people in your neighborhood do things in public. Get out of the house. Do things outside, together with others. Make kids ride their bikes out. Let them skin their knees. Let them fail. Don't protect them from the, 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 the consequences. We got away from that, seems to me. We got away from what's best about this country. We rid ourselves, seems to me that we rid ourselves of things so valuable to us that they literally have no price and we have been invaded by cheap junk. Heroin is what you get when you, when you do that. Today, supply of opiates on our street is so vast, so potent, that getting into treatment can take months and getting out is like Russian roulette. It is one dangerous thing to do. Football is now <clears throat> a gateway to heroin addiction in America. The same is true of cheerleading, I think. That's what happens when, as a culture, you start believing in easy answers, silver bullet solutions to complicated adult problems. The good news is, seems to me, that there is no solution. We tried the solitary solution, right? The sexy solution was going to solve everyone's, everyone's problem. Pain, uh, pills for everybody. Addiction, a jail cell for every addict. Parents alone in their, in their bedrooms, uh, crying themselves to sleep at night. Doctors not talking to compromise, a dirty, a dirty word. I think it's time we stop believing that there's an easy way out, that old rules do not apply to us, that we have no need, in a sense, for each other. No, there is no solution. There are many solutions each part of a mosaic, a group of solutions, a community uh, of, of solutions. And happily, I believe happily, none of them is sexy. Not one will do the trick alone. And that's a good thing. So this story is far, is far about far more as, than, uh, than the drug trafficking and pharmaceutical marketing story that I thought I was writing when I began. To attack it, I think American history provides templates for how we might do so. One of them is the Marshall Plan. I believe with this country, with the Marshall Plan, those of you who are too young, the Marshall Plan was after World War II. We rebuilt major parts of Europe to develop allies, to develop trading partners, to keep the Soviets from uh, encroaching. I think we need a, a, that kind of commitment over many years, a Marshall Plan for American recovery, a way of treating parts of the country that have lost out in globalization, lost out in free trade, as places that really do need our help. We've looked at them as losers. We've laughed at them, blamed their own destructive self-behavior on, on themselves too often, it seems to me. I think there are lots of little things, though, we can do. One is, of course, that doctors and nurses simply have to begin to more judiciously prescribe these pills, taking into account to whom and in what quantity they're prescribing. Still, even today, we are, our prescribing has dropped in this country, but it's still almost triple what it was in the late 1990s, although it's come down since uh, 2015. <clears throat> <Pardon me. clears throat> Let me add this, though. I think 
as we get into this, one of the things that we should not do, we've done seen happen far too often, is that doctors have been cutting off patients who are on high doses, simply saying, okay, you're on your own, time to stop, I'm not giving you any more. This is a perfect way of adding to people who are rushing in, in into the, the black market. It's cruel and it, it's completely non-productive. <clears throat> I think another thing that, is, that has been used all across this country that I think um, I find to be one of the most radical ideas is a rethinking of jail. We need, if, if we cannot um, arrest our way out of it, we need more treatment beds. Where are we going to find out? How many neighborhoods are vying, vying to be the next place where you be to build, build the next rehab, drug, drug rehab clinic? Very few places like that. We have the, 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 the infrastructure built. But we need to rethink how we use it. Jail up to now has been a place for people to vegetate. It becomes a place where people, after they leave it, are so stressed or worn out, they run right to the drug guy's house. But in this country today, you are seeing jails all across the country rethink how they do jail, how they do it. It's now they've become full-time morning, noon, and night rehabilitation clinics. You're in there, you opt in, and from the morning when you wake up, you make your bed military style, to 11 o'clock at night, you are working on your recovery. It's a whole new uh, way of adding to the treatment capacity that is now saturated every place, uh, uh, every place you go. But above all, I think it's time for people to come together, and I see this happening in counties all across the country. It's a very, very invigorating, very exciting thing to watch people come together, form, form task forces and groups, bringing together different voices, different people, leveraging those, those, the college president, the recovering addict, the narcotics officer, and the primary, primary care doctor. Using all of that together, this is this. It's not sexy, as I said. It's not. It's it's not revolutionary. But it is something that this country needs to do. It turns away from what got us into this, which is this horrible uh, isolation. Those of you who are working in recovery, those of you who are in law enforcement, those of you who are in, who are in the legal trade working on the, these issues, I want you to know, finally, how important I think you are to all of this. And I want to ask you that, though I'm sure you may become discouraged, given that the numbers don't stop rising, for you to keep on. They'll, they keep rising like high tide. It's not a time to grow embittered, to grow uh, uh, hardened. Do not lose energy. Your neighbors need you badly, whether they know it, whether they want to, they can express it or, or, or not. Your churches and your schools need you badly. Columbus and the rest of Ohio, Charlotte, North Carolina, Salt Lake City, they all need you in this as well. The whole country needs you. It will most, I, I want to say it most likely will not be noticed the way it should. Because in life, you know, most real change is not sexy. It takes pay, place piecemeal. That's just the way it is. But have no doubt of your importance. The country would be truly lost, it seems to me, without you. And I have faith that in time, your neighbors will thank you as you continue on in this most important work. In time, your town will thank you. Your county will thank you. Your country will thank you. And for now, in case you haven't heard it for a while, I'd like to say thank you all very, very much. If you all have any questions, critiques, scathing comments, feel free to just yell them out. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I think, yikes. I think there was some of that. There was um, funding by the pharmaceutical companies of these um, uh, uh, associations, the pain association, this kind of thing, the, the chronic pains, this kind of stuff, that, that were um, important in lobbying that. 
And I'm not sure that there was necessarily the quid pro quo, like the payment, like bribes and so on. It was more a creating of, what would you call, kind of phony constituencies, you know, where people were saying, hey, well, we need this. Oh, of course we need this. Oh, this is really important. Well, really, what's behind that is just a lot of drunk, drug company money. And eventually, a lot of those went away. Several of those went away, I think, in the last few years. Uh, one, a famous one, was in Baltimore. Uh, they ba basically shut down once it was finally discovered what they were really uh, 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 about, you know. But I think, see, the thing was, that I, I, I think I would caution against feeling like this was some kind of nefarious conspiracy, too. This was a lot of doctors were feeling from us, health consumers, that we wanted, damn it, some kind of solution. It's important to understand, too, that in, in, in medicine, you know, uh, we had gotten used to m miracles. I mean, miracles. You know, we, we dr and drugs that that allowed us to not pay the price for our for our bad behavior. You know, bad consumer choices and behavior. So there's drugs for hypertension. There's drugs for cholesterol. There's lower cholesterol. You don't have to stop eating well. I have to stop eating poorly. You just take those, you know, statins and what have you. These kinds of drugs. There was a lot of those through the 1990s that got us used to the idea that medicine was going to cure most of our problems. And pain, I think, was just kind of like part of that. So my feeling is that there was some of that. There was scandalous pill mill docs out there adding to the supply. Yes, but. But I think it would miss the point if we said, well, those are the bogeymen, those are the guys we should blame. Yeah, they need to be, you know, the pill mill docs need to be locked up or stop what they're doing. And a lot of them have and did, were, were prosecuted and so on. But, but I think overall, this was something that got back to a culture in our country that, that was very isolated, very individualistic, wanting just what we wanted, you know, kind of a, a, a the, 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 the the consumption above all else and wanting to just feel like we were, uh, you know, just be comfortable, I think. And that that then has an effect. It has a ripple effect and it begins to, and doctors, talk to doctors. I think it's amazing. I love talking to doctors about what they um, encounter when, when these people, when they tell people in their office, hey, you know, you need to lose weight. I talked to a doc in West Virginia the other while back, and he said, you know, I would try to tell him, look, your pain is related to how much, your chronic pain is related to how much you eat and you need to get exercise, and they do not want to hear it. They want, they, they, towards the end there, they were demanding antibiotics for symptoms of the common cold. You know, all part of this idea that just, quick, let's get it done. And of course, part of life is like that. Our American style of life is very quick. A lot of work, people, we work a lot. We're in the car a lot. You know, it's not, but there's more to it than simply, I, I think, the, this kind of uh, a conspiracy. There's a, there's a lot of other things going on, it seems to me. Yes, ma'am. In your research and travels, um, who's doing it right? I mean, what states are turning things around? Well, I think a lot of states are doing good things, really. Um, I would say Ohio's done a lot of really great things. Honestly, it's a, such a tough problem they face in that state. A um, lot of places, as I said, Charlotte, Salt, Salt Lake, all these different places are affected by it. But, um, and and so, so I guess what I like most is when I see um, as I said, counties coming together. You see this over and over across America now. Counties coming together, forming task forces, bringing these different people together to then say, what are we going to do? How, how do we design a strategy? What can we do? Who's, who's available? You leverage all that energy, all that talent, all that expertise, all that budget. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and, and again, and the, the problem is, though, there, as I was telling the group earlier, uh, there is no big invention that's going to solve the whole problem. It takes time. We took 20 plus years to get into this. And people get very impatient. Well, why isn't what we're doing working? Because it took 20 plus years to get into it. You know? I mean, it's a cultural thing now. And, and what, is it, what does it mean? You know, I was writing the other day and it hit me. What does it mean as a country this is spread for the first time? first time 
that this is not spread by drug traffickers, it's spread by doctors. What does that mean? That means that we all wanted to be part of it. We all were demanding it. The doctors didn't respond to a, something that wasn't there. They were responding to an absolute demand that we wanted, uh, that they, they felt very viscerally from, from, from us, you know, and that we wanted to be absolved of our, of the swage of our pain. And, and so, um, so I see a lot of places doing the, what I would believe to be, I'm a reporter, but I, it seems to me like, a lot of what they're doing seems to be on the right path. The problem is uh, we need to be patient, and we're not so patient in America sometimes, particularly when it comes to uh, public policy. We want immediate results, and somehow somebody must be to blame if the results are not immediate. And I come, I'm a reporter in the, uh, for a lot of years, and, and one of the things I like least about my profession, I don't think I did it myself, um, didn't have opportunity to, I would say mostly, uh, is to uh, use the, 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 the enormous and very important power that the media has, the press has, uh, towards keeping people accountable, particularly elected officials, and use that as a kind of a tantrum, as a way of saying, you're not doing anything right, always you've got something, something's wrong, nothing can be right. And um, I don't think I did that in my career, but I would say that that's what bothered me most in the, in the, in the media, that there isn't, um, the people don't know, <coughs> pardon me, well enough when something's actually working. And part of that has to do with reporters being too young and not knowing their job very well. But that's a whole other issue. But to my way of thinking, we've got, we've got lots of counties out there, lots of places working, and it just, it, you know, it just takes, takes time, takes, and people, and takes people understanding that it takes time, I think. That's my thing. Yes, sir. Do you believe the new management thought on Oxycontin? I'm sorry, I can't really hear you, sir. Do you believe the management at Purdue thought in their minds Oxycontin was addicting or not? Well, I, it's hard to say because it was a big company and I don't know who thought what. I think there was, there were people who were taken in by that and thought, no, this is, this is, no, this is a non-addictive drug. I'm just convinced. And then there are others who probably didn't. And as time, the problem is, it, it, at what point in time are you referring to? I think early on, everybody thought it was going to be non-addictive. And then, but time passed and the results and the data was showing some clear contrary evidence. And I think a lot of people then, uh, then it became a little bit more difficult. Some people just wanted to push on, I think. Uh, I, what I do think is that, um, that there are a lot of Purdue salespeople from that. It seems to me, and I, this is a hunch, okay? Uh, and I'll tell you why it's a hunch. Um, but that it seems to me that there's a lot of Purdue salespeople from those years who have enormous regret. And um, I say that because only based on a few anecdotal conversations I've had with people who've been in contact with them. I tried valiantly to find folks who would talk with me and I found several, but they didn't want to talk, you know. But uh, I remember talking with a doctor uh, who was an addiction specialist in West Virginia, a professor, and he was saying, they brought me in, they hired me to come talk to them. Uh, and they, it was clear to me that they were all feeling enormous apprehension, remorse, or something like that, that they were very, um, uh, the, the questions were, were fraught with, are we doing the right thing kind of thing. And he brought in a, a woman who was an addict, and, and she told him how easy it was to get and how 20 minutes from now she'd go out and find it and come back in 20 minutes and you know she later died of an oxycontin overdose as a matter of fact but um I, so I, i've heard a few of these conversations i had a conversation with a doctor who got addicted to his own drugs and then became a um well he now works in a homeless shelter in west virginia and he he had a uh, you know conversion to christianity and became a, a lay pastor uh but he um said that he had a conversation with a guy who called one time and they went on for some time and, and, and
and the guy was probably drunk, he thought, and crying, and I'm sorry, I did, we didn't know what we were, you know, that kind of thing. It was, so I'm feeling that out there, if you actually had, like, a hundred, all of you guys were Purdue reps, you know, and you did a poll for those folks who worked from 1997 to 2003 or four, <laughs> something like that, that you would find a lot of them, you know, very, very upset. Um, and, and probably remorseful, not <coughs> probably willing to talk on the record, but nevertheless. Yeah. Yes, sir. The thing in your book that amazed me is how long the Jalisco. I'm sorry? The thing in your book that amazed me was how long the Jalisco distribution system went on to, under the radar with everybody clueless. Right, yes. And um, uh, he's referring to um, a part of my book I didn't really talk about. It's uh, if I had it probably here all night, but nevertheless, uh, there was a, uh, a there's a town in Mexico uh, in the state of Nayarit, it was on the Pacific coast, where all the guys in this town who were, came to the United States uh, learned a system for selling black tar heroin that was like pizza delivery. So you would call uh, the you, you the addict would call the, the number and they would deliver it as if you know, to wherever you were or they'd meet a, 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 a hookup spot and tell you to go there. Um, the reason I wrote about the Jalisco Boys, first of all, because I thought the system was just fascinating, but also the important under thing to understand about them is that they were not the only Mexican heroin traffickers, and, and, and they were all not the only ones trafficking black tar heroin. They, they were important to this story because they're the first ones, when they tr cross the Mississippi River and go to Columbus for the first time in 1998, they come at the very time when this big promotion of pills is happening. And they, they are important in this story because they're the first group to recognize and then systematically exploit the coming market for heroin that the pills, massive prescribing of the pills, Represents. They are the ones who are right there when it happens. They're very close to the buyers, to the addicts themselves. They're right on the street with them all the time. And so they figured this out before anybody else. And most of the Mexican drug trafficking infrastructure didn't want it, didn't care about heroin. It was more interested in cocaine and meth, and that's the glamorous money drugs, right? And it wasn't until many years later that they got onto that. But these guys were there. They figured out what was going to happen, those guys. Back in 1998, think about that. 20 years ago, they knew that this whole pill problem was eventually going to percolate, to, going to evolve in, in, into uh, a heroin problem, and and they they that was what amazed me also about that that system that that those guys <coughs> excuse me figured this out and, and worked it. And today, you know, they are still working. But they're not, they were big fish in a the, in the small pond, right? Is that cliche? Back then. But now the pond is an ocean, it's, the, the market has expanded, exploded, really. And so they're still working it, but they're not the major players in each market where they are and most of the time, I, I think. In, in, in Columbus and Charlotte and those kinds of places that are known for this, they're not like, there's a whole bunch of other people involved now. So that the market has changed on them, although although at the time they were like far far ahead uh, in understanding of, of, of a lot of uh, far ahead of understanding a lot of uh, the understanding of a lot of narcotics officers here of what was going to happen with this massive expansion of pill prescribing. One more question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I worry that okay. Let's say we can fix this opioid crisis. There's very, very complicated to fix. Let's say we fix it. I'm very worried about another drug yeah. across the entire country that currently is legal in some states, illegal in other states, and I, I'm afraid it could be a substitute for people who go, God, my life is so stressful, you know, I, I need some help. Uh, I'm depressed, I need some help. And I think our country is going down the path of legalizing this drug in every state, and I, I think it's horrible. And that would be marijuana. What do you think about that? Well, we just talked about that. <laughs> and the group that I, uh, uh, earlier, the, 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 the commission I was uh, speaking to. And I'll, I'll, I'll say, tell, the, the, tell you what I told them. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, I think we've, we've lost sight of some of the, the basic lessons of this story and also the basic lessons of the end of Prohibition, what we did. You know, during Prohibition, uh, because alcohol was illegal, what grew up uh, was a lot of mutations. Turpentine was called liquor. All these things were called liquor, right? And people drank them. And they would, you know, they would create blindness and paralysis and shaking and all this kind of stuff. When we legalized alcohol again, we, le we didn't legalize that stuff as liquor. We legalized 2, 3%, 4% wine, liquor, all that kind of stuff. We, 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 we kept it, you know, we kept it like limited to in, in what was, was actually legal, that it was actually something remotely considered uh, liquor. Um, the similar things happen with marijuana. <clears throat> we have now marijuana that's, because it's illegal, underground botanists in Mendocino County and so on have figured out how to hybridize 25, 30, 35% THC marijuana, which is more like LSD. That's not really marijuana that they're selling that, you know? It's called <coughs> marijuana because the, you know, but it's not. It, the effect of, of, of regular marijuana is not, 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 that, not like that. I do believe in, in legalizing marijuana because it, I lived in Mexico. And when I lived in Mexico, it became very clear to me that marijuana was the gateway drug for all those nasty cartels down there. And the most toxic influence in our hemisphere is not ISIS. It is those drug trafficking cartels down in, in Mexico. And we are funding them, and we're supplying them with guns, too, by the way. But that's another issue. Um, so I, I believe in legalizing. On the other hand, I came back from Mexico, went to Mendocino, saw what it, it had become in, in the illegal world, and realized that it was now the stuff that was being called marijuana was more akin to, like, plant-grown LSD or something like that. And so I began to say, no, we can't, that's crazy. To legalize that, to call all this stuff marijuana, is, is nonsense. It's not, we, and what's more, we need to take a lesson from this story here, opioids and stuff, by saying, what is the lesson here? The lesson here in this story is that what, what, do you, what happens when you unleash a, legal, a new, legal, highly potent, drug on the population? That's the question, it's bad stuff. The consequences are great. And so we, did not, we have not taken that into consideration when it comes to, to, to marijuana. And I'm afraid that we will face, yes, I agree, that we'll face some, some kind of consequences similar to, to these in, in, let's say, 10 years or what have you. Um, I do believe in legalization. I, I believe there are medical benefits that need to be processed from marijuana, but that, that's a whole other thing from saying, I think we should then legalize uh, 20, 25, 30% THC. Oh, we don't know enough about it. We need to be humble. We need to be cautious. And I think doing what we did with, with, with alcohol is probably the best way. Legalizing certain limited amounts of, of potency, 7, 8%, maybe, something like that. While we study it, while we study it for 10 years, while we equip our law enforcement with the ability to deal with, with the, the worst effects of it, while we design an enormous new, <coughs> similar to smoking kind of campaign telling people that just because we legalize it doesn't mean it's a good idea to use it all the time. All that kind of stuff is what we need. But we're rushing, rushing into this, like, you know, like we haven't learned any, it's like we just erased our our memory or something like that. We haven't learned anything from prohibition or from this it, 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 it issue. And I understand you have a, a thing coming up in, uh, in, in June on, on, on your ballot here about, about this and medical, medical marijuana probably helps a lot of people, but you, I mean, most of the benefits, my understanding from reading the science, and I'm not a scientist, so, but what I have read seems to me to indicate that what is really beneficial about marijuana is known as CBDs with the, the elements uh, uh, within marijuana, and that does not make you high. So med medical marijuana ought really to be very, very low in the euphoric effect and high in these other elements. Uh, but that's not the way it's going, and we risk, I think, creating a, uh, I was just telling folks, uh, I agree with one of the doctors, 
we, we risk creating, we have big pharma, big tobacco, we're gonna have, maybe already have, uh, in some areas, big pot. And that's a scary idea to create a new money interest that wants things one way. So, that might be my answer to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So just real quick, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Oklahoma Commission on Opioid Abuse concluded its work and we issued a report today. It's on our website and it's, uh, it was, we appreciate the excellent coverage from the Oklahoma media. We uh, are very hopeful that those of you who attended tonight will take a good hard look at it. Uh, we attempted to deal with this problem in a multifaceted way, dealing with both supply and demand. Okay, supply requires more control over prescribing, more control over supply, um, more attention to the doctor-patient privilege with respect to what is the right amount on the front end and what should condition, what should the conditions be, um, again, based on doctor-patient privilege. Uh, when should it be prescribed? What are the alternatives? So on the on the demand side, uh, we've got to get into prevention. Uh, educating young people at an early age is something that is not in school curriculums. It needs to be in there. Uh, moreover, uh, when you when you deal with this in a comprehensive way, you've got to understand that dealing with demand means helping people get well. All right. Drug courts not properly funded in this state. Specialty courts aren't funded. Uh, there are a lot of pressures out there. Uh, the commission has tried to come up uh, with a revenue stream that will assist in uh, getting treatment and rehabilitation programs funded, particularly uh, the drug court and specialty court piece of things. Uh, if we're gonna decriminalize possession, we gotta help people get better. And we don't have programs like that in the state right now. So again, we're not just wringing our hands here. We've come up with an approach to get some revenue. Um, we are proposing a 10% tax on uh, opioid providers in the state. Uh, so there's different places in the revenue stream where we're gonna um, try to have the uh, tax assessed. We're looking to make sure it's constitutional and practical, uh, but we think that could raise somewhere between 14 and 18. Uh, 17 million dollars and that that certainly gets us started down the road to uh, where we need to be to get uh, these things funded so again we're dealing with supply and demand uh, hopefully simultaneously so I commend the report to your review and if uh, if you feel motivated to talk to your legislator there are several here tonight we appreciate your attendance uh, I wouldn't stand in the way of that so again Sam great presentation thank you thanks, thanks very you, much and thank you all for coming we're adjourned thank you very much.